you notice lately that there seems to be a problem with shooting? You know, guns. There seems to be a problem with being able to discern or tell what the target is. But there seems to be this issue with being able to know target acquisition. You know, acquiring the target, you know, and recognizing the target, and then being able to zoom in and zero in on the target. Because you see, what I'm finding lately isn't so much about target shooting as it seems to be friendly fire. What can I say? More often than not, you know, as I read my Bible, as I kind of like open up the scriptures and I look at it and I see, oh wow, by this shall you know that you're my disciples indeed and that you have love for one another. Pull me out of the net that they have privily laid for me, for that were my strength. Into, into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. When I look at what's happening in the world, often I see people choosing to do things that don't make sense outside of the world. It might make sense in their world, but when it comes to God's perspective, somehow I don't think they get the big picture. You know, it's kind of like a foot soldier telling a general, oh, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it. I don't care that you're looking at the map. I don't care that you're telling me the enemy's here. I don't care what you're saying. I'm going to go shoot these guys. And as it turns out, he's shooting the wrong bow. As a matter of fact, more often than not, I see Christians shooting each other in the foot. You know, kind of taking a stab at each other. You know, kind of like what the warning was when we're told that Satan would strike the heel, would bite back. Couldn't quite, Satan can't quite really like, you know, do anything to the person itself, you know, that when you stepped on the snake, you know, the snake would bite back. Because, you see, Satan can't do much, but he could strike your heel and kind of trip you up, make it hard for you to walk. And that's kind of what I see lately Christians doing. They're following after doing things that only Satan would do. You know, trip someone else up. Shooting someone in the foot. Making them not able to accomplish that which God has them doing. You know, God was interesting when he was walking on the earth, you know, because he said that whoever's not against me is for me. Uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, he also said something interesting was that, hey, no man can receive that with which they are given except it was given to them of the Father. So don't forbid them from doing something, but rather look at them and recognize that God might be using them for his purpose. And you need to focus in on your purpose and forget about what might not be the purpose that God has you shooting someone in the foot. So I see a lot of times Christians using friendly fire to try to accomplish God's will. I don't get that part. You see, in my mind, I think, comfort ye one another, saith the Lord, encourage one another, Strengthen one another. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Be the light of the world. Be the encouragement. Be the love that binds us together. And we would find ourselves to be his disciples indeed, and that you have love for one another. Lately, I've been seeing kind of like, you know what? More excuses to not love than there are to actually prove our love towards each other. And Jesus said, and this shall you know. Oh, so if I don't have love for the brethren, if I don't have love for those other you know, people like over there and over there, then am I his disciple? But I have the target. I, I, I have them in my scope. Just let me pull the trigger. Just let me take a pot shot. Well, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Can we be clear about this? Can we say it again? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Can we say it again? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, 
what are we shooting at? And why are we shooting it if it's flesh and blood? We should not be attacking the unbeliever because he's an unbeliever. After all, isn't that who Jesus died for? We shouldn't be attacking the believer because, after all, isn't that who Jesus died for? So, if flesh and blood is who Jesus died for, why are we attacking them? Why are we shooting them with our gospel gun, so to speak, you know, with our, our self-righteous attitude that we put the bullet in that's not really the gospel, but rather a condemnation message as opposed to a confirmation of the salvation that God has given to all men that they might come to him and be saved. That if we would just lift up Jesus, he would draw all men to himself. So when people tell me they don't know what to do, because they think they have to do something about Sharia law, or they have to worry about Muslims, or they have to worry about Mormons, or they have to worry about this or that or the other thing. I keep going, but didn't Jesus say if we lift him up, all men would be drawn to him? If we just do what he says, that people would be attracted to him? If we just acted according to what God has said, then God would fulfill his word? You see, Somehow Christians got involved in it, thinking they're of it, and that they themselves have to do it. No, get out of God's way. You see, that's the problem with having a gun. Though you may have the right to bear arms, though you may have the privilege to bear arms, though you may have the license to bear arms, though you may be trained in how to use arms or guns and weapons, that doesn't mean you're supposed to use them. You see, in fact, the matter, God says, oh sure, you could have them. You can use them. You could put your trust in them. But if you put your trust in me, I will bring salvation. The Lord always says, stand and see the salvation I bring, as opposed to what God does two men who think that they of themselves can bring their own salvation because you see what happens then is that you're taking the glory away from God and then God says hey I'm not getting anything out of this you're doing it by your own strength of arms you're doing it by your own understanding you're doing it as though you are God and I am not who put you in charge God spoke to Job who put you in charge God spoke to Job's friends where were you when I set things up? Who are you, old man, that you should speak to the Most High God and tell him what to do? And yet we find somehow Christians operating in this sense of misappropriation of who God is and identifying him as an impotent God by putting their actions ahead of their words. That their actions speak louder than their words themselves as they try to do what they think God would do for them if they would but ask him to do it instead of them. Because you see, man looks on the outward things, but God looks on the heart. When we can't see the light, when we are full of gray areas in our own life, we have to look through a glass darkly. When we have to put on glasses that don't really have clarity and we're obscured from the actual purity of the word as Jesus is called the word of God then we don't see clear enough to really acquire our target as a matter of fact as we're looking down that scope and we can't quite identify who the target is then should we take the shot should we pull the trigger should we go ahead and blast away at someone who in fact a matter might be the very person God sent you to save and not to destroy by your attitudes, actions, intentions, directions, choices that you made to operate outside of what God said to do. The bottom line is, when you know the Word of God, it's pretty simple to trust in Him to do what He will do, as opposed to trust in men and watch what they do. Because if anything at all, I've looked at quite a bit of what man can do in his own actions and attitudes, and I don't have to look very far in order to see how messed up men and women are. 
when they operate outside of what God tells them to do. You can look at the government and see it that way. You can look at the politicians and see it that way. You can look at society at large and see it that way. You could look at judges in the court system or even law enforcement or even criminals and see what men will do without God. But you see, you take those very same men, no matter who they are, whether they be a criminal, a judge, a lawyer, a doctor, an Indian chief, a president, a government, a social occasion, or whatever it may be, and put God in that person, suddenly when that person turns to God and asks for wisdom, and asks to be led by the Spirit of God, and asks for God's will to be done, suddenly you see a difference. You see a whole turnaround of events. Everything begins to make sense. Everything comes into clarity. It's almost as though the person takes a pair of glasses and puts it on and realizes, oh my God, I might have shot you. I might have pulled the trigger as I was aiming, but now I see clearly and I realize, no, you're the one that Jesus died for. I don't want to destroy you. I want to influence those principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places that's causing you to do those things that you don't even know that you're doing. So if I could stop that outside influence from causing flesh and blood to act the way they are, then guess what? I'm dealing with the source of the problem than the symptom. Because you see, that's where Christians make the mistake. They're never dealing with the source. They're dealing with the symptom. So they say things like, Oh, well, we have to make laws about abortion. Well, what's the source of the problem? Man messing around with woman. Because if a man was responsible for his own sperm, if a man was not committing fornication in the first place, how would a woman be pregnant? And how would a marriage choose to commit abortion? Would they? In other words, no woman in her right mind goes out to cause herself to be pregnant so that she can have an abortion. Oh yeah, I think I'll go get pregnant so I can have an abortion. No. The fact is, the symptom of abortion is from the cause of fornication. You deal with fornication and you've eliminated abortion. But people want to deal with the symptoms. They want to deal with the outward manifestations of the things that they think are important rather than the source of the problem, which is man's heart. Because if a man was responsible for his own actions, if he cared enough about that woman, specifically in love and comfort, in choosing to allow that union of body, soul, and spirit to become one, that life should exist and come forth out of that union, then they would rejoice in that which God has done. Because they would recognize that God is the giver of life, not man. It's not a question of man's seed and man's woman's ovum, but rather the question of God in the midst of the seed and the ovum causing that creation of life to exist. So the third part, obviously, the source point of all life is taken out of the equation. So man has no clue how to solve that situation because he's always dealing with the symptom and not the source. So we need to come back to the source of the problem. Is it the gun itself that kills someone? Of course not. Is it the right to bear arms that a person chooses to exercise that right and privilege? Of course not. It's the source of man's attitude of his heart of whether he chooses to pick up that gun and use it in a way that was never designed, but that God chooses to use the man in his heart to touch a life, to bring salvation to a soul, that they would become whole and they would be made perfect in his sight so they would be one with God and one with each other. Because after all, in case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of handicapped Christians out there. There's a lot of walking wounded. There's a lot of beat up, stomped on, really shot to pieces Christians out there, bloodied, burned out, and bummed out. And you know, they didn't get that way from the world and its ways. They got that way from other Christians telling them today something that had nothing to do with love, with mercy, and forgiveness. But it had everything to do with self-righteousness, attitude, and action. We need to choose in our own heart of hearts to look at what we think we're doing, how we think we're acting, 
and how we want to become and ask God to show us the way. And then we need to do a simple thing, which really isn't about Tebow. And it isn't about attitudes or bending the knee and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it's about humbling ourselves and making Jesus Christ Lord. It's making that vow that Jesus Christ will be Lord of our lives. And that it's not just a question of an outward action, but it's dealing with the source of your attitude and your problem from the very beginning. Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Or is he just the Savior of the world? Big difference. I would ask you to get down on your knees in the light of his word, in the light of his countenance, as he's shining his light upon you now today, as he's speaking to you in your heart of hearts, get down on your knee and don't just tebow it, but ask God to be Lord of your life. Because Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And if your actions and attitudes are in contradiction to what Jesus has said, he's not Lord of your life.